What's up, Switch? Welcome back. I have missed you guys. Now, if we have not met before, my name is Jeremy, and I have to let you know I had sort of a big summer. Now, don't tell everybody about this, but Coca-Cola has decided to put my name on their cans. How many of you... I know, I know, I know. Now, how many of you, you have got your name and you have drank a Coke this summer with your name on it? All right, good. How many of you bought a Coke for one of your friends that had their name on it and you shared it with them? Raise your hand if you are that good friend. Look around. These are the good friends. Now, how many of you are like my cheap friends and you didn't share a Coke, but what you did is you saw a Coca-Cola can with a name on it, and you took a picture, and then you sent it to your friends, you tagged your friends and said, hey, I see your name. How many of you are that cheap friend? Good. We are in good company. Tonight we're jumping, we're talking about game changers, and we're not talking about people who are on a Coke can. I want to talk about people whose names we know from history. I want to talk about people whose names are what we would call famous, names that are Big. I want to talk about inventors. I want to talk about athletes or band members who set a standard so much that it was a game changer. Now, when I talk about game changer, a name that comes to mind is Steve Jobs. Think about it. Steve Jobs, he changed the computer industry. He changed the way we use cell phones. He changed the way we download music. And he changed the way that we are able to produce movies with Pixar. Steve Jobs is a game changer. I also think of a 13-year-old girl who, when she was 13, started writing in a diary. And she wrote about her life and all the things that were sort of happening in the world around her. And that diary, the diary of Anne Frank, changed the face of literature and highlighted a time in the history of our world. Anne Frank was a game changer. I think of a guy named Jackie Robinson who broke the color barrier in Major League Baseball and because of his character, because of his impact, he changed not only the sports world, but he changed the culture of our country. Game changers. But here's my question for you. The people who are closest to you, would they describe you as a game changer? Don't answer out loud, but think about it. The people who are closest to you, would they say you are a game changer? And if not, why not? Here's an even better question. This time we're going to all participate. By raising your hands, I want you to be honest. How many of you would say I consider myself a game changer. Raise your hand all over our campus if you would say, I am a game changer. Okay, so most of our campuses, there's some of you who are like sort of doing the maybe. There's a few who are like, wham, I am a game changer. And there's some, most of us, who didn't raise our hand. If you would have asked me this question when I was in high school or in junior high, I would not have raised my hand. And the reason why I wouldn't have raised my hand and probably the reason why some of you didn't raise your hand can all be summed up with one little thing. Let's see if you can identify what it is. It's going to be right up here on the screen. Who can tell me what that is? Hashtag. hashtag. Number, depending on what you're using. But this is a hashtag. So for those of you who are familiar with social media, this is a hashtag. And you can use a hashtag to label things. So I'm going to give you a, a brief description. How many of you love to camp? You are outdoorsmen, outdoors women. Throw me in a tent. Throw me out there with the bugs. Okay. I am not that guy. Now, I love my kids who love to do those kinds of things. So this summer we went camping, and I'm going to sort of show you how I hashtag some pictures. So here we go. First picture. Hashtag camping. There you see the lake. You see my tent. It's a good start, right? Now, the reason why I hate camping would be because this next picture right here. Hashtag poison ivy. Now, I also, during this trip, got poison ivy. But if I were to post a picture of my poison ivy, 
I would be thrown in jail and you guys have lots of questions and we're not going to talk about it anymore. All right? Now, this message here, this is just for high school. So that, you know what I know? You guys are smart. You guys are wise. You guys know how to handle hashtags. And you guys know how to play a game that is E for everyone. So we're going to play the hashtag game. The way it's going to work, we're going to put some pictures up on the screen. And with the people around you, I want you to hashtag the picture. Now, remember, this is a G crowd. Okay, let's not do anything that's going to be inappropriate to get any of us thrown in jail. We ready to go? Yep. No, let's try again. Are we ready to go? Yeah. Mm, here we go. First pictures. What's your hashtag? And there we go. Hashtag Avenger. I like that one. Next one. Whoa. What's your hashtag? Hashtag Tic Tac. All right, here we go. Next picture. Hashtag bad seed on the plane. There we go. Here we go. Next one. All right. I know that was a little bit of a cheesy game, but here's what we found. I could put a picture on the screen and we were all able to hashtag or label those people because we are able to hashtag. We all hashtag things. But here's what we also know. We all get hashtagged. We all get labeled. And what I want to do for the next couple minutes, I want to share a couple hashtags that I received in high school that have stuck with me for most of my life. First hashtag would be this. First hashtag would be hashtag unattractive. Now, as I say that, let me tell you a little bit of the backstory. Acne, love handles, spandex shorts, never a sexy combination if we're just being honest. That was me in junior high and even the start of high school. It was a bad fad. My parents bought my clothes at Kmart. It just did not work well for me. You know, there are people that were like me who would be like, oh, they get to college and be like, you know what? I saved myself for the right girl. No, we didn't. God saved us for the, for the right girl because we were so ugly. We were unattractive. <laughs> All right? And that's, but I remember I was unattractive. And part of this, I, it happened at a church camp. I remember I was swimming and one of the camp counselors came to me and said, hey, man, you can go put on a T-shirt because you're too fat. Now, here's the deal. Up until that point, you know, I, I sort of knew the term husky. That's what my pants sort of said. And I sort of sort of caught on whenever it would come time to take pictures. And instead of saying smile, my mom would say suck in. So we'd be like. Oh. <laughs> but when that kid, I, I remember the leader's name, when he told me, hey, you should put a T-shirt on, guess what I did? I put a t-shirt on. And what's funny is I kept that t-shirt on all the way until I graduated. Even though I went past the whole chubby stage and got past it, I still took that shirt off because I kept believing something that someone had told me. The next word that if I were to say, hey, here's a word from when I was in high school, it would say this. B team. B team. When I was in junior high, I played all sports but I was a B-team player in every single one of those sports. And I remember one particular game, I got to play in the fourth quarter, and I thought I was the man. I scored a couple points. We won the game. And I was so convinced that I was going to get promoted up to the A-team that I went and had a talk with the coach. And I remember his name was Coach, coach Hoddison. I said, hey, Coach Hoddison, was it possible that I'm going to be on the A-team in the next week or maybe the week after? And I'll never forget as an eighth grader, what he said to me, he said, Jeremy, you will always be on the B team. Man, you're in eighth grade. You don't forget something like that. You will always be on the B team. Jeremy, you're not going to be good enough. Well, since I wasn't winning school, at least there was one place I could win, and that would be at home. But here's what you need to know about my family. Hashtag dis dysfunctional. Now, my family would joke, and we'd be like, oh, we put fun in dysfunctional. No, we didn't. Redneck just ran deep through my, my veins, okay? You know that picture we showed of that grandma who was dressed like Santa Claus very poorly? That was my grandma. Not in that real picture, but in real life. I remember... 
as a kid, my grandma going clubbing, like showing up in a mini skirt with hooker boots and be like, I'm out of here. And I had to call her Aunt Judy instead of Grandma Judy. It was redneck, okay? Now, and there was all kinds of, there was kind of, there was alcohol and a whole bunch of different things that played into my dysfunctional family, a lot of inconsistency. But let me tell you one of the things I heard as a kid in this dysfunctional family. I heard, hey, you ruined Christmas for us. Hey, you ruined my birthday. Hey, you ruined my life. Hey, you cost me my high school senior year. So another hashtag that I sort of put on myself based on all these stories I kept hearing is, hashtag, I must be a mistake. So how many of you, just by raising a hand, you think maybe those words affected who I was as a person? How many of you think that's possible, that those words affected who I was? Yeah. They did. And here's what I know. Every one of you have had a hashtag or a word put on you that has shaped who you are that probably shouldn't have shaped you. And here's sort of a a point. What we believe determines who we become. What we believe determines who we become. And I want to look at a story of a woman in the Bible who experienced this very specific thing. So if you have a Bible, or if you have you version of your phone, turn to John chapter 8. And we're going to jump in right there. John chapter 8. And so as I set the story, here's what's happening. Jesus is basically walked into this area, into the temple, which the temple sort of like the church. And all these people have gathered around to hear Jesus talk. And if you don't know much about Jesus, you may think that because Jesus was from God, that he's a religious person, all the religious people liked him. But that's actually not true. The religious people did not like Jesus. And in this story, the religious people are trying to get Jesus to say something wrong so they can say, aha, hashtag loser. Okay, that's what's what's going down the story. So pick up in verse number two. It says, but early the next morning, he was back again at the temple. This is Jesus. And a crowd soon gathered and he sat down and taught them. As he was speaking... The teacher of religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. And they put her in front of the crowd. Okay, so it's not like, hey, we're going to bring her and have a conversation with just Jesus and this woman. This whole church is surrounded. All these people are in a circle. And they bring her into the middle and they say, teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. All right, for those of you who may not know what adultery is. Basically, this woman did the horizontal hokey pokey with somebody who wasn't her husband. And they got busted. But they didn't bring the guy back. They just brought the girl. And now this girl stands here next to Jesus with these religious people. And there's a big crowd watching. Now, there's hashtags, right? If I brought somebody out here right now and I said, hey, we just caught this girl out in the parking lot having sex with a boyfriend in the car, and I brought him out here, you guys would have some labels for them. You would have some hashtags. And that crowd did too. You know, there were those people who looked at her and had a lot of empathy and said, oh, hashtag poor girl, hashtag bad choice, hashtag, oh, I feel bad for her. Then there were the other people. Those are a little bit more hardcore. Her like hashtag slut, hashtag whore, hashtag marriage wrecker, hashtag Wrecking ball, hashtag Miley Cyrus, hashtag twerks don't work, hashtag part in the USA, hashtag Billy Ray Cyrus's daughter, hashtags don't break my heart, hashtag my achy breaky heart. Okay, so that's all hashtags. But what they, they, there were some who went so extreme, these religious leaders said, hashtag this woman is not fit to live. Listen to what it said. It says, the law of Moses says to stone her. So the religious people say, hey, Jesus, heads up. The law of Moses says we are supposed to stone this woman. Now, this is not some drug reference. This is they're literally picking up rocks and throwing them at the person until the person dies. So that's what's happening. But they say, but Jesus, what do you say? And they were trying to trap him to saying something they could use against him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. So they're saying, hey, we just busted this girl She deserves to die. Jesus, what do you think? And he begins to write in the dirt. What was he writing? I I don't know. 
Uh, if you've ever heard the phrase, sweating like a whore in church, it's actually derived from this passage right here. Actually, I made that at the time true. So, but, but right now, this girl has to be freaking out because he is a rabbi. And if he says, yeah, go ahead and kill her, guess what happens? She dies. So what's Jesus say? Nothing. So they keep demanding an answer. So he stood up again and said, all right. Go for it. Kill her. To which that woman, I'm sure that her heart dropped to her stomach. And Jesus kept talking. He said, but the person who's going to do it is this. He says, all right, but let the one who has never sinned cast the first stone. Hey, the one of you who has never messed up, the one of you who doesn't have any hashtags, the one of you who is perfect, you're the one who has to throw the first stone. And remember, this crowd is watching. And they're watching these religious people. And listen to what happens next. He says, when the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. You see, Jesus understood something about hashtags that I probably didn't understand until a couple weeks ago when I heard a message by a guy named Perry Noble. Do you know who has the right to pass out labels, to pass out hashtags? It's two people. The first one would be this. It would be the creator. Think about it. If Nike produces a shoe, they have the right to put their label on the shoe. If Apple makes a computer, they have the right to put the Apple on the computer. The creator has the right to put a label onto something. Do you know who's the second person who has that right? The second person is the person who buys it, right? How many of you have ever gone and you've gone to like a, your parent bought you like a basketball, a football, a softball, something like that, and they hand you a marker. What do they say? Put your what on it? Put your name on it. Why? Because you own it. It's yours. And Jesus understood that this point that I want all of you to catch. You are not who others say you are. Any label that you've walked in here with, any hashtag you have right now, you are not who others say you are. You are who God says you are. You're not who others say you are. You are who God says you are. So the story ends, the woman walks away. But the most important part of the story happens right then. She has to choose, who do I believe do I believe this man, this Jesus character I hear? Or do I believe all these people around me? And let me tell you the truth about all this for us here at Switch. We want the same thing for you. We want you to figure out who is it that you believe? Who is it that you're listening to? When you walk out of these doors, are you going to listen to what Jesus says about you and believe that? Or are you going to be on the other side and say, here's what other, everybody else says about me. I'm going to believe that because it's going to lead you to two different places. I'll finish with this story. Uh, my brother-in-law, he had a car. It was a 66 Impala, and it's all tricked out. It's all original. It's money. And he decided one day he was going to race my sister across town. She's in a 1987 Honda Accord. He's in this Impala. They race across town. He kills her, gets to the house, waits in the car for her to get home. She pulls into the garage. And because he's a man, he let his car roar. Vroom. But as he let it roar, he heard a cuckoo, cuckoo. And he turned the car off right away. He had some friends come over, check it out. And they said, oh, man, bad news. You threw a rod through your engine. And it cost, it was going to cost thousands of dollars. So for 10 years, he saved his money so that he could replace the engine in this car. For 10 years, this car sat on jacks and didn't do what cars are supposed to do. Finally, he saves up the money. He takes the car to a specialist in Colorado. He gets there. They look at the car and they say, the engine is perfectly fine in your car. The problem with your car is you blew a $40 water pump. Now, here's the deal. He never took it to 
a dealership. He never took it to the creator. He just let the people who were around him tell him what was wrong. And because of that, his car did not do what it was supposed to do. And my fear for some of you is that you have walked in here tonight and you believe some hashtags. You believe some lies that aren't true about you. And you're just sitting on this, you're sitting in the garage and you are not doing what God has called you to do. You're not living for the purpose he has called you to live for because you are believing a lie. And that is what is keeping you from becoming a game changer. And my desire is that you would identify what is that word what are those two words? What are those three words? What are the things I need to change so that I can make a difference? So that I can change the game. But you have to figure out, who am I going to listen to? Because what I believe determines who I become. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes real quick. Some of you in here tonight... You walked in here and you have bought into some things. You believe that you can't make a difference. Maybe you believe you're too young or that you're too immature or that you're just too lazy. Whatever, what, you, there is something that's keeping you from being a game changer because there was a lot of you at the beginning who didn't raise your hand. My question is, is, what was that thing that is keeping you from being a game changer? What's that thing that is keeping you from listening to what God says about you? What are you going to do to get rid of it? You see, God has a plan for all of us. Plans to prosper us, not to harm us. Plans to give us a hope and a future. And I don't want your life to be stuck in the garage for 10 years only to realize that the thing you're holding on to is a lie. How many would be honest tonight and say, Jeremy, I can, I can think of at least one thing in my mind that's keeping me from doing what God wants me to do. If that's you, I just want you to raise your hand. Say, hey, that's me. I'm not going to point you out, make you dance or sing. I just want to pray for you. God, I pray for these students, and I pray right now for that thing. I pray that you would just show them how to get rid of that so that they can let you move in their life because you are the greatest game changer. And I pray that you would use them to change the games in their family, in their schools, in their community, on their teams, and that you would get all the glory. With your head still bowed, nobody looking around, I want to talk about another game changer. You know, some of you walk in here tonight, and it's not about, hey, what's the thing that's keeping you from hearing from God? But it's, what's that thing keeping you from connecting with God? The Bible says that because of the things that we've done, every time we mess up, that that separates us from God. And that, separ that, that sin, is what they call it, means to miss the mark. And the Bible says all of us have sinned, and sin keeps us from connecting with God. So God, because he's so awesome, said, hey, here comes a game changer. I'm going to send my son to this earth to live a perfect life and to die on a cross so that those who are far from me can be close to me. So those who are disconnected can be connected. So those who are missing out can find the true answers. And for some of you tonight, this is your game-changing moment. Tonight's going to be the night that you are going to say, I want to have a relationship with Christ. I want to give my life to the game changer. And you, we're going to do that tonight. So here in a couple seconds, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. I want you to be bold. I want you to be strong. Do not listen to the enemy who's going to try to tell you, hey, this isn't for you. This is for you. If you do not have a relationship with Christ, tonight is your night. Today is your game changer. Who here would say, that's me. I want to start a relationship with Jesus Christ for the first time right now. Raise your hand.